quick announcement. Number one, if your phone is uh, set on to the Wi-Fi, please, unless you are on call for your job, turn the Wi-Fi off uh, because we're currently at 57% drop frames for uh, the uh, live streams. Please and thank you. Really appreciate it. All right. And we have your Bolton Tandy couple of announcements. Um, I do have uh, one change just to bring your attention, your attention regarding next Sunday, which is the 6th. I got a message from Aaron, who is Ted Scott's grandson. They're not sure they're going to make it here in time for the worship service um, because they've had some things come up. So um, we'll keep you posted if there's a reschedule or if they will be here sometime after the morning church service, like when we're having our luncheon to talk to everybody. They uh, were going to go into the mission bill and they just had a uh, some scheduling conflicts, so we will have to work on trying to resolve that. If you have your bulletin handy, you'll have uh, two pieces. You have this little, little thing right here. We're going to cover this first. Ladies, this is for the West Central Christian Service Camp Women's Retreat. Uh, on that, you have some important information about the retreat. And then on the back side of it, you may notice that it's a uh, crease there. That is your registration form. You can tear that off. And then there are instructions on where it should go, I believe. On the bottom. On the bottom. There's where you mail it to you after you fill it out. And please make your checks payable to West Central Christian Service Camp. Do not make it payable to the Women's Retreat. Do not make it payable to Emily. Do not make it payable to Melanie. Make it payable to the camp if you'd like to go. The information for the retreat is there. It is the 29th through the 30th. Uh, the first workshop is at 5.30 p.m. on the 29th, with the banquet at 6.30 p.m. The theme is rest. Oops, drop a little here. All right, and then uh, any information you need about that is in there and on that. So if you have any questions about the women's retreat, talk to Emily. She is on the planning committee for that. Uh, she'd be happy to answer any of your questions. If you have your bulletin handy, on August 16th, downstairs in the Fellowship Hall, that is a Wednesday evening, we will be having an ice cream social here at the church with ice cream and board games. If you have any questions about that, see Rita. Uh, for the, we're going to be doing a school supply drive for Show Me Christian Youth Home. We will be collecting until August 28th. Items are there in the bulletin if you need them. Uh, if you have any questions about that, we'll also see Rita on that one. The list in there is the list from last year. Okay. So we just had, I, I had haven't seen an updated one. Hey, Chad was going to email me the okay. list, and I, I didn't check this morning, but it wasn't there yet, well, like Friday or so. That's fine. I just had last year's list, yeah. so there, there may be some updates that they might need additional yeah. to this, but this is a good springboard for us. Okay, so this is our starting list. There may be changes coming soon. Just keep your eye open for that. Ladies Missionary Group will be meeting the August 30th at Rita's house at 11 a.m. We'll be working on normal projects. Homecoming has been moved to the 17th, and the reason why it's been moved to the 17th this year is we will have joining us Alan Sibley, the Magnolia Ramblers, which is the Bluegrass Group. So we're looking forward to having them as well. And then there's, again, the Women's Retreat information is there as well. Show Me items continue to be um, canned soups, fruits, vegetables, Please, no home can. I know you ladies are good at that, but it must be commercially canned. Uh, box food, cereals, cold drink mixes, paper products, cleaning and disinfecting wipes. Are there any other announcements? All right, if not, anybody with a birthday or anniversary this week? We're moving around almost morning. What? Linda. Linda. Come on up. If y'all would go ahead and stand. It's the, oh, it's today. Well, happy birthday. All right, we're going to say the birthday blessing. It's okay. Many happy returns on the day of your birth. May sunshine and gladness be given. And may the dear Father prepare you on earth for a more beautiful birthday in heaven. Happy birthday. Thank you. I'm excited. Your birthday's today. Make sure you can tell her happy birthday. All right. Turning our attention towards worship this morning, I'll be reading Psalm 1 as we begin our service. How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked, or stand in the pathway of sinners, or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction, and he meditates on it day and night. 
He is like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not like this. Instead, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand up in the judgment of sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to ruin. Every single one of us here this morning that is in Christ, we have been made righteous through the blood and sacrifice on the cross that our Lord willingly gave on our behalf so that we may be able to enter boldly before the throne of the Father. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before your throne, to you be all glory, honor, and praise for you alone are worthy. Lord, as we lift up these songs of adoration and praise, may they remind us of the gospel, the truth, and the love that we have through your word that we experience in knowing your son, Jesus Christ, who paid our penalty on our behalf. Father, it is a message of hope and life that we've been given. It's a message that we've been given freely, a gift that we've been given freely. May we share it freely as well. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen.
next hymn this morning is hymn number 28, To God Be the Glory. Oh, 
This morning I wanted to, uh, to talk a little bit about faith. And uh, I think everybody's familiar with <coughs> Hebrews chapter 11. And here we kind of have faith defined. It says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. So the world tends to look at faith a lot of times as um, like fairy tales or make-believe or, well, you know, we can't prove that it didn't happen, therefore it's not too bad. But if we go back over to Mark, we have, first off, we have faith defined. Here in Mark, we have an action, a, an example of faith in action. And in chapter 9, I think most people are familiar with the story of the father that brings a demon-possessed child to Jesus. And uh, starting in, uh, in verse 20, it says, So they brought him. When the Spirit saw Jesus, he immediately threw the boy into convulsions. He fell on the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And this is one of the examples where I think we can see Jesus' humanity. Not just his concern, but his, his action as a man. When he answers back, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty telling. Because even Jesus can kind of lose his temper sometimes. And Jesus says, if you can, everything is possible for one who believes. So Jesus says, in essence, did I stutter? No, I didn't stutter. You know, your faith is so weak that you're not accepting the truth. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. And that is, I think, the father's plea was basically, help my faith, help me to grow in my faith. And like I said, I think faith is our ability to accept the truth. Not to accept stories, not to accept lies, not to accept fairy tales, but the truth. Because the world so often rejects the truth. How many times did Jesus perform miracles? And what happened? Half of the crowd said, hey, we're going to follow this guy. And the other half of the crowd says, oh, no big deal. I've seen that trick before. And they go off on their own. But the father in this story, he says, not just don't help my faith, help it to grow. And I think our growth in faith is our ability to accept more and more and more of God's truth over time. You know, a lot of times we tend to pick and choose. We'll flip through there. Oh, that looks good. Well, that one, I don't know. Oh, well, that's okay. As we grow in our faith, we accept and internalize more of God's truth. And it took me a long time to figure out. I always thought faith, you either had it or you didn't. But there's varying levels of faith. And uh, hopefully, as, as we get older and wiser, that uh, we're growing in our faith. That we are adding to our acceptance of God's truth. 
So communion time is a chance that we have to express our faith in the truth of Jesus Christ. As we come around the table, we share this celebration of our faith in what He did for us. We pray. Father in heaven, thank you again for this day. We do pray that you would help us overcome our unbelief. As we take the bread this morning, help us to be reminded of Christ on the cross. It's paid for our sin. Be reminded of the love that, that you have for us because you came down, sent your son to rescue us. And we're grateful that, that you rose him from the dead so that we have hope of eternal life. In your name we pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we take the cup that represents the blood that was so willingly shed, Father, help us to put aside our will and to live our lives according to your will. As we attempt to grow in our faith, as we attempt to internalize and accept more and more of your truths, <clears throat> help us to share that with the world as we go out so that the world will know who you are and the hope and the reason that we have for our continued faith in you. We pray all of this in your son's name. Amen.
going to lead us in an offering prayer. Father, thank you for this meal today you provided for us. We ask that you get those that couldn't make it here for whatever reason that might be. We also ask that you get Rob as he leads us today. And we take what we learn and take it home with us and apply it to our daily lives. This time we ask you bless this offering with the gift we give her and my brother Jesus. Same thing. And I think a lot of times we look at 
our faith. And we always say, if you would have been there, he was there through all these troubled times. And he was there uh, and seeing Mary and all the other ones that were around, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in the spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. Now the significance of Jesus weeping, people have different ideas on it. But in his humanity, just like in mine, he wept as a human being. He knew the pain. From his inner being, he knew the pain. In his divinity, he raised him from the dead. So when we see this, and we see our list, and we see the pain in people's lives, uh, the struggles with addiction or death in a family or anything that we go through as human beings, we can always know that He is hearing us. He is there. He has always been there. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank You for this opportunity to be back uh, in your house with my family. I thank you for everything that you've given us on this blessed day. And I pray that you would, as we offer up this list on the altar of sacrifice, as we should do every day for our families and our friends and, and our, our church family, I pray that you would consider you would consider these prayers. We know that you are there. We know that you are listening. But we have to know that it has to be done in your will, not our own. So Father, I, I pray that you would watch over these, these people and their problems. And, and if there's any un unanswered prayers or silent prayers, that are here today, would you please consider them? And thy will be done. And I ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Kids are dismissed out of the adventure. for there were many who were following him. When the scribes who were Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard this, he told them, It is not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. May God add his blessing to his word. So, most of you know that Emily and I attended Central Christian College of the Bible in Moberly, Missouri. While we were there, there were a bunch of scandalous events that broke out. And you may think that that doesn't happen in a church or a Bible college. I can tell you right now, you'd be wrong. But what is interesting is that this, this scandal was quite big. It actually proved to be very dangerous to the college itself. What happened was there was an infamous series of emails sent out to the entire student body and several supporting churches containing information regarding some alleged underhanded dealings. The fictional 
Jose Emanuel, a pseudonym for the actual party responsible, sent these emails out. The point of the emails was to reveal to the student body and church supporting church that some of the upcoming changes to the, the college faculty were actually not as they were portrayed. So the idea was that the faculty members that were older were going to step back and were going to start to work their way into retirement making room for some younger professors to come in and start to take over for the longevity of the college. However, according to the emails, what was really going on is to try to save money, the school was basically laying off the older faculty so that they could have this younger faculty at a less pay rate. Now, I'm not going to say whether any of that was actual validity, but it was quite a scandal. And it actually came to a head when they started pulling students into administrative offices, questioning them about these emails, trying to find the individual that was responsible. You had really three different parties. You had the school administration, you had this guy, Jose Emanuel, whoever he may be, I think they missed an opportunity to go Jesus Emanuel, just to kind of explain on the idea of what they were going for. And then you had the student body stuck in the middle going, I don't know what's going on. Well, some of the students, what they ended up doing was they decided that the best course of action is we have this guy's interpretation. Why don't we go to the administration and try to figure out what's going on? Try to get both sides of the story. One particular student, though, thought that if the president of the college and some other people were being indicated in this scandal, it was probably better to go to the board of directors to try to get some information on what was actually going on. Unfortunately for the student, it didn't go well. And what ended up happening was, instead of getting a response to the board of directors of which she emailed, she got called, yanked out of class, and pulled into the president's office. So did her fiancé, because they assumed that he knew what was going on. And as they were there, they were basically told, here's what's going to happen. You're going to drop this. You're not going to pursue any more further questions. Otherwise, there will be severe consequences up to and including you being expelled from the college. It was at that moment, if you were those individuals sitting in the office listening to that, you're like, huh, maybe there's something to this, right? At least that is what you would get. Now you have to understand what the college was trying to do was to just try to do damage control. Anybody that's ever been involved in any form of administrative work, you know there comes a time where you just kind of have to lay down the law, do damage control, and try to get things under control and not keep dumping fuel onto the fire. But it was quite a scandal. And if you think over the recent last couple of years, we see a lot of scandals happen. We? we see a lot of scandals in economics, we see a lot of scandals in health organizations, we see a lot of scandals in politics. We see a lot of scandals in our country left and right lately. What is interesting about a scandal is there's often two sides to the story. There are often interpretations and different things that go on that make you question what is the truth. Here's something that we probably forget about Jesus' ministry. By the standards of his day, Jesus' ministry, as you've seen as we've been preaching through the Gospel of Mark, was scandalous. It was full of scandals. Because he did not live up to the expectations of those who were in power during his day. They said, you should behave and act this way. And Jesus went, you have no idea what you're talking about. This is what you're supposed to be doing. And so his ministry was very, very scandalous. But you know what else is scandalous? The idea of grace. The idea that despite our sin, despite all of our darkness and all of our evil, that God would love us enough to send his son to die on the cross on our behalf. What a scandal. And if you think about it, it completely was an alienated concept to the Jewish religion of Jesus' day. They believed wholeheartedly that for you to be saved, you had to work out your salvation. You had to be good enough. You had to do this and do that. You had to dot your I's and cross your T's to earn God's merit. But they failed to realize that even the Old Testament itself revealed that no matter how hard man may try, 
apart from faith in God, man is not capable of earning their salvation. Isaiah chapter 64 verse 6 says this, All of us have become like something unclean, and all of our righteous acts are like a polluted garment. All of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities carry us away like the wind. You see, our society repeats much of the mantra of the first century Jew. Our society tells us that being a good person is sufficient. But we fail to understand the gravity and the damage that sin causes in our life. No matter how good we may be, no matter how many good deeds we may do, we are still guilty because of our sin before a holy God. Only God can make us holy. Only God can cleanse us from our sin. And he did that by sending his son, Jesus Christ, as an offering for sin. The gospel centers around that truth, that Christ died according to the scriptures, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 says, For I passed on you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Notice that. According to the scriptures. What scriptures is Paul talking about? He's talking about the Old Testament. When you read that, Isaiah 53 should come to your mind almost immediately. We see in the Gospel of John that John says that for God so loved the world in this way, he gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Through his death on the cross, the Lord paid the penalty for you and for I and for the sin that we have committed so that we may be reconciled to God. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might be the righteousness of God. Christ took our place on the cross. He took our place and took all the weight, all the guilt, all the shame on himself so that you and I can be justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. It's Romans 3.24. Salvation is a gift of God. It is a beautiful and wonderful gift given to us in grace. It's not based on how good we are. It's not based on some miracle we've done. It is based on the fact that He loves us and paid our penalty. If you've ever read the book of Ephesians, you see that the Apostle Paul talks about this at great lengths. Ephesians chapter 2, he begins by saying, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, which you previously walked in the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit, now working in the disobedient. But Paul goes on to say that we all too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath, as were others also. But God, who is rich in his mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might display his immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And then you go on to verse 8. For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift. Not from works so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared ahead of us to do. So we are saved by grace. Now you may ask, well, why is this so important when you look at the story in the Gospel of Mark? It's because the Pharisees, you may remember, they had set themselves apart. They had said that we are, we are holy ones, we are set apart. And their whole goal, their whole focus, was that you had to earn your salvation by following not only the law of Moses, but all of their traditions and all their rules and all of their regulations. And we've talked about time and time again how some of them were kind of ridiculous. Some of them were absolutely silly. They had manufactured self-righteous works for people to maintain, to be saved. And then you get in the New Testament, you have someone like Paul in Romans 11, 6, who says, Now if by grace, then it is not by works. Otherwise, grace ceases, ceases to be grace. So there are people, even today, who distort the gospel by saying, 
you have to have XYZ works to be able to enter heaven. We call that legalism. When you read the book of Galatians, you see that Paul had a general concern for the church in Galatia because they were turning back to the Mosaic Law. They were turning back to this works-based salvation. He goes, no, don't. In fact, he says in chapter 1, verse 6, I'm amazed that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are troubling you and want to distort the gospel. And then he tells them, but even if an angel... We, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to one that we preach to you. Let a curse be on him. As we have said before, I now say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you receive, a curse be on him. You see, Paul was appalled that the Galatian church would turn quickly from the gospel of grace, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and turn back to a man-made human religion in which you're trying to achieve your righteousness. You're trying to achieve your place in heaven. When God has already paid that debt in full through Jesus Christ. Now yes, are there good works and good fruit that should be produced in keeping with repentance? In keeping with faith? Absolutely. But apart from Christ, our works will never be sufficient. We need Christ. And so I want you to think about in this context, in the Gospel of Mark, as we've seen Jesus interact with people. The Pharisees are appalled by the fact that Jesus so actively and willingly interacts with the outcasts, interacts with sinners. They are appalled at the fact that he does not separate himself from these sinners, but instead he befriends them. You see, the Pharisees saw anyone who befriended a sinner as an enemy of God. What the scandal that we see in John chapter 2 is that God demonstrates his love and grace through his son. Contrary to what the Pharisees thought should be done. God receives unworthy sinners by grace. So if you're taking notes this morning, you have your bolt in handy. There are four points. There's the call of the outcast. It's going to be verses 13 through 14. There's going to be the community of sinners. It's verse 15. And there's going to be contempt of the self-righteous. That's verse 16. And finally, the condemnation of the Savior. Verse 17. So let's look at verses 13 through 14, the call of the social outcast. You know, as we work through Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, we saw Jesus teaching and healing people in Peter's house. But now he's decided to go back to the shore, to go back to the Sea of Galilee. You may wonder why, but if you think about it, it's not really that surprising that he would do that, because as we saw last week with the paralytic, it was hard for people to get to him. How many of you have ever been in a place that's super... Super crowded, even though it might be a big building, but you've been somewhere and, yeah, you're waiting in line forever to get in the door. Every year we go to Winter Jam, which is that Christian concert. It's like $15 at the door now. It's a really good concert. Every year that we go and every year that we have gone, do you know how long we're in line? Anywhere between two to five hours. Because it's packed. The T-Mobile Center, when it used to be a sprint center, it is absolutely packed. And I remember one year, Somebody forgot to put their knife in the church van, despite the fact that we had warned, it, warned them. And I actually had to get out of line and take their knife back to the church van. And once you get out of line, you can't go back to where you were. One, because they don't allow it. And two, because there's too many people, you can't get through the crowd. And so I was already at the end of the line, three block. I went all the way to the end of the line, three or four blocks away. Praise be to God, I still got in. But there was just so many people that even if you could, you couldn't get through and when Jesus was preaching in Peter's house and teaching and healing people, there were so many people there to receive healing. You couldn't get to them. Remember, the guys had to take their friend all the way around to the back of the house, climb up the stairs, dig a hole in the roof, and lower the guy down for him to get healed. And so after that, Jesus is like, hey, we're, we're, we're going to go out to the, to the seashore. Now, what you have to understand about that is that actually works great for preaching and teaching, though, because there are a lot of places along the Sea of Galilee and along the, the seashore around the Capernaum where, guess what? There are natural amphitheaters. There are places where the hills cone up, and so it would be easier for Jesus to teach and preach and everybody to be able, everybody to, be able to, to hear him, number one. Number two, it would be easier for people to be able to get to him and interact with him. So he leaves the house, and he goes to a place where people could hear him. And he teaches, and he preaches, and we don't know how long he's out there. 
But on his way back into the city, he passes by a tax booth. Maybe a toll booth might be a better translation. And he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting there. And Jesus does something scandalous. He says, follow me. And you may think, well, that doesn't sound like such a big deal. Come follow me. Okay, he said that to Peter. He said that to John. He said that to James. He said that to Andrew. That doesn't sound like a big deal. Levi, or Matthew, I'll use those names interchangeably, the same guy, is a tax collector. How many of you like the IRS? Yeah, don't raise your hands. Especially since it's on camera. Yeah, nobody. Nobody likes tax collectors. Nobody wants to. Ah, that's a so and so internal revenue service. Uh, our records show you owe us ten thousand dollars. Ain't nobody want that phone call, right? Or that knock on the door. But do you know that's even worse in the first century? So for Jesus to call a tax collector, shockwaves echoed out through the rabbi or through the, the crowd because no self-respecting, respectable rabbi would ever speak so kindly or invite a tax collector. For that matter, any self-respecting Jew would turn around and walk the other way. They hated tax collectors, even tax collectors who were Jewish by descent. And here's the reason why. Because tax collectors were part of a lucrative business operation. What they gained in wealth, they lost in social respectability. Tax collectors were among the most hated and despised because their position allowed them to get wealthy off the backs of their countrymen. So here's the way tax collecting worked in the Roman world, just so you kind of have it. The person that was actually in charge of collecting taxes was the regional governor, which in this case would be Herod and Tippus, Tippus the Tetrarch. But they wouldn't want to do that because how many of you want to go door to door collecting stuff? No. So what they would do is they would go, hey, Dennis, if you'll collect this district, you know, you can keep all the profit. And so what they would do is the person that would bid, the most competitive bid, would get that district. They would get that ability to collect taxes in that area. And here's the way that it worked in terms of the quota. Rome gave you a minimum Quota. As long as Rome got that, they did not care. But they didn't tell Clyde what his taxes would be. They didn't tell Tim what his taxes would be. That was up to Dennis. You can already see what the problem is, don't you? And so what would happen is the tax collectors would be the ones not only to collect the taxes, but assess the taxes. And so they might have some high financial aspirations. Maybe they want that new yacht. Maybe they want that new boat. Maybe they want that Ferrari or that new house. Or maybe they want something else. And so they would go way beyond what Rome required of the taxes. Which, by the way, Rome had several taxes. Rome had a poll tax. So guess what? To go out to the lake, you had to pay a tax. To come back into the city, you had to pay a tax. That was the toll tax or the poll tax. You want fishing, Ryan? Guess what? You have to pay a tax to take your boat out on the water. You have to pay a tax to bring your boat back in on the water. You have to pay a tax for the fish. It's a lot of taxes, isn't it? It's starting to sound familiar. You also had an income tax of about 1%. You had a land tax. Your land was taxed one-tenth of all your grain and one-fifth of all your wine and fruit that it produced. Taxes were levied on transportation of goods from one city to another. Taxes were levied on the use of roads, on crossing bridges, and other various activities. Rome had the minimum standard, the tax collectors decided how much it actually was, and therefore it could be easily inflated. But here's the problem. If you didn't pay your taxes, who were you in trouble with? The tax collector or Rome? Rome. And so all the tax collector would do would go, Tim, you didn't pay your taxes. Hey, Centurion Matthias, Tim Barry didn't pay his taxes. Will you dispatch a legion or a garrison? And so Rome would come knocking on your door to collect the taxes that you didn't owe. You only owed a little bit, but they said you owed this much because they knew the tax collector was milking you for more. 
What makes this even worse is the tax collectors understood that maybe Becky couldn't pay her taxes. And so what they would do is they would go, Becky, hey, I will loan you the money to pay your taxes to Rome, but here's the interest rate. So if you were to think of what the tax collector in the first century world in Israel was, it was like having the IRS and a payday loan company combined into one thing. They got you coming and going, so now you can kind of see why they were hated, can't you? In fact, most Israelites consider tax collectors traitors. In fact, the religious elite would ban tax collectors from attending synagogue. They were lumped in as turncoats, liars, and traitors. And given the description of Levi's tax booth that is on the way back into the city, he probably was in charge of collecting the tolls, the tariffs, and the taxes involved in the city's fishing business. So guess what? Who lived in Capernaum? Peter, John, James, and Andrew. You want to talk about mixing a boiling pot together? Four fishermen who have been taxed by this guy, they know they're getting ripped off, and Jesus says, hey, Levi, come follow me. Peter's probably like, what? Do you know who this guy is? Jesus is like, yeah. Levi, come follow me. And the people would have hated that. So you can see the scandal of the grace offered. But here's the thing. Jesus saw more than just a tax collector. He saw someone who was wretched and miserable and distressed by his guilt. He saw something that everyone there did not see. And he said, come follow me. And it's exactly what Levi did. He left everything. He left his tax office. He left his career. And he followed Christ. He went from being a money-loving tax collector to a Christ-loving, a Christ-following lover of God. Gave up everything. Reminds me of what the Apostle Paul said. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 or 8. But everything that is gained to me, I consider to be lost because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and considered them as dumb so that I may gain Christ. Levi was willing to give it all up so he could receive an eternal reward, an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. He lost material possession but gained spiritual life. He lost earthly security, but gained a heavenly future. He had been barred from the synagogue, but now he was in the presence of the Messiah. But it wasn't just that. There was also a community of sinners, and I don't know if you caught that. They go back to Levi's house, and they have this massive banquet, and there are all these sinners and tax collectors present. There the Son of God is intermingled with tax collectors and sinners. They were probably criminals, thugs, maybe enforcers, probably prostitutes. From the perspective of the religious leaders, they were the refuge of society. But from Jesus' view, they were the mission field. The fact that Jesus reclined at the table suggests he was there for quite a while, folks. And no respectable rabbi would have never been present. Let alone eat with that group. Let alone be with them. Because in the first century world, to share a meal with someone was that you accept them and that you wanted them to be a friend. For Jesus to eat with such a group was an absolute scandal. <coughs> Notice how the Pharisees respond in verse 16. When the scribes who were Pharisees saw he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? They had seen the dramatic version of Levi him leaving everything and following after Jesus. They had seen what Jesus had been doing in Peter's house. They had seen all of the miracles up to this point, but they continuously, meticulously scrutinized everything Christ did because they wanted a reason to accuse him. Now, I don't think they went to Matthew's house, to be honest. I think they probably stood outside. But they noticed he was eating. And their anger was kindled because no sinner should eat with a rabbi. So whether they interrupted the festivities or they waited until afterwards, they pulled the disciples aside and they go, hey, why is he eating and drinking with tax collectors? They don't really care, by the way. 
They are not curious for an answer. It's full of contempt. Their question is rhetorical, and it's intended to be a rebuke. Because they saw Jesus doing something that was unlawful. Remember, eating and drinking with someone symbolizes what? That you are their friend. That you accept them. So that Jesus would share a meal with unclean and disreputable group, it enraged their vindictive hearts. The Pharisees presided for them prided themselves on maintaining a strict separation. But do you notice the irony? The irony is that their judgmental attitudes exposed them. What were their jobs? They were the religious leaders. They were the people that were to guide people to God, but they didn't want to get themselves dirty. They didn't want to be seen with the sinners, the people that actually needed God. Instead, what did they want? They wanted to be separate, to keep themselves away. And this is what brings the condemnation of the Savior upon him. This is what angers Jesus. He responds in verse 17. When he heard this, he told them, it is not those who are well who need a doctor. There's that stab at them. They think they are well, so they don't need a doctor. But those who are sick. Jesus pointed out the fact that the Pharisees don't need him because they think they're well. They don't think there's anything wrong with it. They don't realize that they are sinners just like the tax collectors. They don't realize it because of their pride and their arrogance. So Jesus almost, I think, sarcastically says, it's not the well who need a doctor, but the sick. You're questioning why I'm meeting with them, because they're the ones that need the physician. If you think you're well, you don't go to the doctor. But if you are sick, you go to the doctor so that you may be made well. They are sick, they are lost in their sin, and they are coming to me so that they may be made well. You think you're healthy. You think you're well. But you're wrong. Jesus says, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. He's not talking about people who are actually righteous. He's, he's got a little bit of a little bit of a zing in there. He's referencing their self-righteousness. He didn't come to call them. They put on one great facade, one wonderful charade, but he's not fooled. He can see right through them. And so he uses that medical analogy to illustrate his compassion and nature. While the religious leaders would have agreed the tax collectors and sinners like Matthew were spiritually sick, they would not give them the spiritual care. They needed a great position. Jesus is exposing the scribes calloused hearts by showing that they would have preferred to leave the sinners in their disease, which would lead to death, instead of guiding them to the Father. Jesus shows that he is the great physician and is willing to heal them. But he also points out that the Pharisees are spiritually blind and they don't realize they need a physician. So if I may put it in a, and hopefully not hit too close to home, but if I may put it in a modern analogy. The Pharisees are like a doctor who has cancer. They have a disease, but in their pride, they won't admit it. They don't want to get it treated. But because they have cancer, then they have an anger against people who have a cancer, and they don't want to do anything to help those people. That's kind of the analogy I think that works in our society. They are spiritually blind. They do not realize they are blind. And they have no desire to help other people. Jesus tells the Pharisees, if you look at the parallel accounts, like in the Gospel of Matthew, he tells them to go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. We see that in Matthew's rendition. And it's interesting because that phrase, go and learn, it's a rabbinic expression used to refute a lack of knowledge or to refute someone who's being foolishness. And the weight of that phrase would not have been lost on the scribes. Go and learn what this means. And then he quotes Hosea 6.6. 6, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. He was calling them out for their hypocrisy. Jesus finishes by declaring his ministry. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. The Lord's ministry was to call those who needed to be saved, who wanted to be saved, not the legalistic hypocrites. Those who recognize their sinfulness cry out for mercy, 
and depend on God's grace. The Pharisees, however, didn't think there was anything wrong with them. So what do we get out of this? I think we need to be careful. I think we need to be careful not to repeat the mistakes of the Pharisees. The church of Jesus Christ does not consist of perfect people. It consists of forgiven people. We know that we are not righteous apart from Christ. We know that we cannot be righteous under our own power. Instead, we receive God's righteousness as a gift of grace through faith in Jesus Christ based on what He did on the cross. We've been pardoned and accepted by God. But we have to understand that there are other people that need to hear that message. We have to understand that there are other people who are sick, who are in need of the great physician. And one of the greatest dangers that could face the church today, and even destroy the church today, is the church becoming too much like the Pharisees. Becoming too much like a religious elitist. We spend a lot of time wobbling over doctrinal and secondary issues among the churches. And sure, there are some that are important to take a stand on. Nobody would deny that in this room. But when we too, spend too much time fighting over tradition, we're not spending enough time evangelizing. There are a lot of sick people in this world that are spiritually lost and dying, and they need to know that there is a physician who loves them and wants to heal them. Jesus says, come follow me. In your life, have you accepted that? Have you responded to that call and left everything to follow him? Or have we become like the Pharisees and not realize just how sick we can be? That we need a physician. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we ask that as we go out this morning that you would make us a servant. Help us to walk in the newness of life that your Son has so lovingly provided on the cross. Lord, help us to have opportunities to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, the hope and the love that is found in Him. But Father, also guard our hearts so that we will not become like the Pharisees. It's perhaps the greatest deception that Satan has ever laid since the fall in the garden. That to be saved, we have to, to do this and this and this and this and this and this and have this big old to-do list that we miss out the fact that we are saved by grace through faith. Yes, of course, we should produce good fruit. But the fruit is not what saves us. It is in Christ alone. The fruit is the evidence that we are in Christ. That we hear His words and as His sheep, we follow His voice. Lord, we love you and thank you. Jesus, holy and precious name. Amen. Closing song is Make Me a Servant. Page 381. If you would go ahead and stand, I'm going to start the music.